Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's DEI lecture coming from Michigan Engineering. I'm Sarah Pozzi. I'm a professor of nuclear engineering and radiological sciences and the director of diversity, equity, and inclusion at Michigan Engineering. It's my pleasure to introduce to you today a very special speaker, Dr. Fermi Okenlami, who is the Director of Student Accessibility and Accommodation Services at the University of Michigan, where he oversees the Office of Services for Students with Disabilities. He's also an Assistant Professor of Family Medicine, Physical Medicine and Rehabilitation, and Urology at Michigan Medicine. And he's also an Adjunct Assistant Professor of Orthopedic Surgery at UCLA. So it's my great pleasure to uh, give you now Dr. O, as he is affectionately called in our community, uh, for his talk on disability. So Dr. O, please, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Dr. Potsy. As she said, I am Fermi Okanlami. I use he, him, his pronouns. I am a young black man with brown skin, short black hair. I've got on dark rimmed glasses, a checkered collared shirt with a wooden bow tie and a blue blazer. In my background, you can see some plants, a flag from the president and a little cabinet. I identify as a wheelchair user after having a spinal cord injury in my orthopedic surgery residency. And I am delighted to join you all today. Now, one of the first things I tell people is that I don't like giving talks. Now, anyone that knows me or has heard me talk before will say that is a bold-faced lie. This man loves to talk. Now, I'd say it's not that I said I don't like talking. I said I don't like giving talks. So what I hope that today will be is I truly hope that this will be a conversation and that those of you that are in the audience will, will recognize that you all have your own thoughts and opinions and perspectives on this because if my voice is the only voice we hear today, I've done a disservice to all of you. So with that being said, please, I encourage you all to try putting questions in the chat throughout. We will leave a dedicated time at the end for Q&A as well, but I will try to address some questions as they come up and then leave ample time afterwards. So jumping right in, disabusing disability. People often ask me, what, what does that actually mean? Like, where did you come up with this from? And I tell people that to disabuse is to try to sort of rid someone of the notion of, or to, to change the description of disability. Now, trying to demonstrate that disability is not inability or that it doesn't mean inability. Now, hopefully as, as we go along and I tell a bit about my story and about the relationship that I have with disability, each of you will then see how this is an interconnected sort of ubiquitous experience that many of us have and that we see that disability is just an aspect of diversity and one that we need to embrace and one that just adds to the, the colorful fabric of this quilt of diversity that we have here. So I always start off using this image to start these conversations. So in this image, to describe it, you will see two sides of a slide. On each side, there are three individuals. I call them tall, medium, and short, and they're attempting to watch what appears to be a baseball game on the other side of a fence. Now, on the image on the left, each of these individuals, tall, medium, and short, are standing on one box. With that one box, the tall individual can see the game, the medium individual can see the game, but the short individual cannot see over or through the fence to see the game. On that side, it says the word equality. Now, as I go along, please feel free to then put in the chat your own thoughts on this slide, whether you've seen it before, how it's been used, what it makes you think about. Please, it doesn't have to be a question, just part, start putting in your thoughts about when you see this slide, what it makes you think of or what it's been used. On the other side of the slide, the same three individuals are there, tall, medium, and short, but now the boxes have been moved. They've been moved in a way such that tall individual is no longer standing on a box and can still see the game. Medium height individual is standing still on one box and can see the game, but then the short individual is now standing on two boxes and can see the game. Now under this side, it says the words equity. Now, thoughts are starting to come into the chat that people are saying they've seen it before and it's a really excellent example. Someone else says that this is the best illustration of these two terms that they've ever seen. Someone said it provides access to everyone. 
Now, these are, are very positive things that people say. And yes, you know, individual chimed in that they've seen a similar image before that includes a third option that says justice. Now, I'll tell you that when people look at this slide, many people are trying to identify a problem. And you know, Evan James Copeland just says, but why is there even a fence? And this is where these conversations get interesting. So when we look at this slide, people think that we're trying to say, we're trying to provide people with access, right? And the left side, everybody has the same thing, the same boxes, and it says equality. Yet not everyone has access to watch the game when they're provided resources that are equal. On the other side of the fence, it then says, okay, well, this equity one, equity is then giving people what they need, giving them what they need to give them access to that game. Now, these are all wonderful things. And just like Tobias brought up as well, it says, you know, why is there, why are there barriers in the first place? So I start with this slide because most of the time, these are the comments that people say. They bring positive things and they say, yes, people should be able to have access. And if we just redistribute the resources, we can all have the same access we need. But I tell you that after a couple of times of using this slide, I put my presentations online often afterwards and someone put in the comments there, why don't those insert racial slur here, buy tickets like everyone else and watch the game from the inside? I paused on purpose to then say that again. Someone said, why don't those insert racial slur here, buy tickets like everyone else and watch the game from the inside. I say this not just to be dramatic or jarring, but I say it because we don't often recognize that when we look at an image, two people can see very different things in that same image. Some of us are looking at this and we're thinking that the goal of this is to then allow people to watch the game and that they should be given access to see the game. Yet someone else looks at the same slide and sees something that means people are trying to get something that they don't deserve. They're trying to steal something. They're trying to get into a place where they shouldn't have access. And therefore we do need to put the fence up to then to encourage people, discourage people from trying to get something that does not belong to them or that they do not deserve. Now, what's been interesting is that I show this slide and one day someone raised their hand in the audience back in the day where we actually saw each other face to face. And someone said, you know, the fence is not there to keep people out. We have a fence there to keep things in. You know, where I grew up, there was a busy, a busy road on the other side of our softball field. And, and if that ball rolled across that road every single time, we put ourselves in danger having to go get that ball. And additionally, not even a safety thing, but to play the sport, if I hit a home run with no fence, I have no idea what a home run actually was. But we love people watching our game, so we don't intend to keep people out with the fence. What we want to do is then allow everyone to then have access. And so if we don't realize that there may be very legitimate reasons why people see things differently from each side of the fence, then we're never going to get to a solution that is then providing access for everyone. Now on the same side, yes, someone just says, we don't know what people on the other side of that field paid. So we're not sure what it took to then get to the inside of the fence. And we don't know what the people did to then be on the outside. So it's much easier to have conversations around these things with cartoon characters on an image. But it's even more difficult when we say that the reality of what our world looks like is more like this. I've now changed the slide and to, to continue with the descriptions, there's a third panel of the same slide with the same three people. But on this slide now, the tall individual standing on seven, eight, nine boxes well above the field the medium individual standing on one box and can see the field, and the short individual is now standing in a box-sized hole and can barely see above the ground, let alone above the fence. This side says reality. When I look at the first image and I describe to you how the boxes were moved around, if you look at this as a resource and that resource is money, the same amount of money to provide equality was then used to provide equity. So when we talk about resource allocation and a redistribution of efforts, then people say, well, we can just move things around and give people what they need. But the reality is that some people have more resource. But when that comes up, the question is, why do I have to give up my box for someone else? I don't know what that person did to dig a hole for themselves in this place. And so why should I have to fill that void? Why should it be my responsibility for all the things that I did? to then support them. 
And so this is where it gets closer to the reality of the situations that we're in. When we talk about diversity, equity, and inclusion, when we talk about providing access to individuals, the reality is that we have haves and have nots. We have people on either side of the fence. We have people that then have a different perspective on what they're even looking at. But in order for us to then be speaking the same language and having the same conversation, we need to be trying to understand what problems exist and how we are working together to then solve them. Because if we don't see the same problem when we look at this slide, it's impossible that the solution we come up with is going to be one that's accessible for all. So, you know, 10 minutes in at this point, people are probably wondering, what does this have anything to do with disability? And it's because this slide, I think, then drives home how I try to introduce these concepts. In this third slide, we now have a different set of individuals. So I'll describe them for you here, because in the first ones, I told you that people said, why don't those insert racial slur here? Those individuals I didn't say, but were looking like there were people of color. There was a darker complexion to individuals in the first set of slides. And this slide now, I think this one captures a lot of the diversity, equity, and inclusion conversation. So same type of image in which you have an image split into two with two halves. They're watching what now looks to be a real football game coming from a Nigerian man. This is soccer or football in this image. And you've got three individuals. On the left side, there's the tall individual. There's then the medium individual. And then there's an individual that's seated in a wheelchair. You also have what appears to be different skin tones that are trying to be represented in this image. You have different lengths of hair, different clothes, which are trying, in my estimation, how I use this slide, trying to acknowledge sort of the, the diversity of gender, the diversity of race, the diversity of ability and disability status. And then I also now notice, and it took me a while to see this one, but there's a rainbow in the top right corner of the other half of this slide, which I think is also attempting to then make sure that we're referencing our LGBTQ population too. So in this image, when we look at the boxes and we recognize that now we are trying to be as inclusive as we can, I tell people that as a proud wheelchair user, it doesn't matter how many boxes you give me, that would not provide me with the access I needed to watch this game. And so if we took that same wood and then built a ramp, that is where my phrase, everyone can use the ramp while not everyone could use the stairs comes in. Now, depending on how contentious people want to be, they look at this ramp and they say, ah, oh, Dr. O, it took, looks like it took a lot more wood to build that ramp than to build that one box. And I say, you know what, please spare me. Like, I didn't come up with these slides. I'm just using them as a metaphor. But I then also sometimes clap back and say, you know what, sometimes it does take a little bit more resource. Sometimes it might be a little bit more expensive to then provide that access for someone who then needs it. But should that be the reason we don't do it? Should we have financial reasons be the only reason why we don't strive to provide equitable access for all people? And so this is then where the conversation around disabusing disability comes in. You know, telling sort of a, a brief story of my own life, I tell people that, you know, I was born in Nigeria to two physician parents. I moved to this country when I was young. They both had to redo their residency training and they went to Howard University for pediatrics residency. My mother then went on to Johns Hopkins for her pediatric intensive care fellowship, and my father did his at Georgetown for his neonatal intensive care fellowship before we moved back to Indiana. So we moved to Indiana. I went to private school from fourth grade to eighth grade there, went to Deerfield Academy back on the East Coast for high school, and then I played all the sports, basketball, soccer, lacrosse, track, was captain of the team and president of the class, did all sorts of student groups. And I say this not to pat myself on the back, but because I had a diverse sort of set of experiences. I sang, I danced, I acted. You know, I was, was in the a cappella group and I was a big brother, big sister. And so diversity was just a part of my world. It was not a buzzword. It was not something that I was looking to accomplish. It was just that coming from an immigrant family and living in Maryland and Indiana and Nigeria and Massachusetts, I had always seen lots of different people from different walks of life. And it was just part of my world. And then I went to Stanford University for undergraduate and I continued running track and field and was captain of the team my last two years and considered taking time off to then train for the Olympics, but went straight to medical school here where I then ended up finishing my four years of medical school and matching into orthopedic surgery residency at Yale. Up to that point, my physical, my mental feats were what I thought defined me. I show this image here that one of them is me at Stanford University jumping, triple jumping into the sand. I then have the next images of me with my capping down at Michigan Medical School graduating. 
And then I've got a picture of my, my family, my mother, my father, my sister, my grandparents. We have a series of MDs and PhDs and education was very important to our family. And so when I looked at this, I thought as though this is what categorizes me. This is something that I can then have value in the world because of what I contribute to it. But then when I ended up looking like this, an image of me with my C collar on, hours after my first surgery to stabilize my spine after a paralyzing injury that left me with minimal use of my upper extremities and no use of my lower extremities. I had to ask myself, what contributions could I make at this point? And that wasn't because I had not always been told that I was gonna be able to do anything I wanted to do, but because I saw a world around me that was not actually accessible to me. I had not seen at that point enough examples of individuals that looked like this, that looked like me, that had the level of function that I did or did not have, that were doing the types of things that I had set out to do. And so I'll tell people that I was blessed in the fact that I, I was raised in a, in a Christian household that put values in me that I don't take credit for, right? But not everybody has those values. Not everybody thinks in that way. And so I was held together by my faith. But I will tell you that it was difficult at times. There were questions that people would ask that I did not have answers for, that my faith felt like it was sort of a crutch. And I even tell people now after that phrase, I say, there's nothing wrong with needing a crutch, but, but I digress. And so when I was in that world is what I call it, living now on the other side of the stethoscope. It then forced me to recognize how our built environment and the lived experiences of individuals without disabilities makes it such that I myself was complicit in a system of ableism. I didn't realize that the things that I did on a day-to-day -day basis failed to acknowledge the fact that the structures upon which you know, our organizations and our system were built upon were not built with disability in mind. Now, to make this a little bit easier for some people to then understand, I, I juxtapose ableism with racism. Now, sometimes that gets the hair off the back of people's neck to stand up, but I think it's an important thing, particularly now as, you know, in the past year, two years of the pandemic, people have recognized some of the disparities that exist between races. And we've had a, a sort of a new awakening, not just because of the pandemic, because of some of the high profile things that have happened, like George Floyd and Breonna Taylor and Ahmaud Arbery, that race is now a heightened conversation in our country and our world. But I tell people that while racism clearly exists, Racism is not me pointing to the person that's sitting across from me and saying, you, sir, are racist. But recognizing the storied history of our country is not one that is being negative to the person sitting in front of me. It's just acknowledging the reality of where we came from. And until we identify racism and the systemic structures that then have been continued to be built, we cannot dismantle it. Similarly, ableism is that same thing. Ableism is not pointing at the person sitting next to me or across from me, but it's recognizing that this world was not built with disabled body minds in mind. And I say body minds because we talk about physical accessibility and I want to make sure that early on, I acknowledge the fact that disability is not all visible. There are plenty of individuals with invisible or non-apparent disabilities. And as we hope to then disabuse disability, as I said, and change the definition, the perception, the stigma of what disability is, people will recognize that disability does not mean less than. Disability does not mean unable. And there's a culture around disability that many people identify with. And so I juxtapose race and disability intentionally because I do not think that being a black man is a bad thing. Yet I know that there are people that assume negative or wrong because of the color of my skin. There are people that will automatically have their assumptions about who I am or what I do or how I think because of the color of my skin. And the same thing happens with disability now. People automatically think that someone that's disabled will need their help. They automatically think that they're not going to be able to do certain things. And at times it does come from a good place. It comes from people that are trying to say, well, I know the world must, it just must be harder for that person. And so I don't want to then put them through something difficult. That's how I'll tie this back around. So I know we have people from all over the country here, but this is a College of Engineering talk and I'll speak to the engineers in the audience. Because in engineering and STEM fields and medicine, we often think that we're doing a favor to someone with a disability by not expecting more from them. 
We say that we are setting people up for failure by putting them in complicated demanding fields because we do not think that they'll be able to accomplish the tasks. Now, what I tell people is that I've been blessed with the opportunity to recognize and to feel that because of all the support I've been given prior to my disability, I had a level of sort of confidence in myself that I felt as though I was going to tackle the world regardless. But it's because I was also afforded opportunities like this. I was given a standing frame wheelchair through my vocational rehabilitation. And in this image you see on the left side, I'm in my standing frame wheelchair looking over a microscope into a slide during my obstetrics and gynecology rotation in my residency about to go deliver a baby for someone whose water had broken. And then on the right side that I'm here fully sort of gowned up in my PPE prior to the pandemic times, about to then access someone's radial artery to do a heart catheterization. Now the standing frame wheelchair was an accommodation, it was access that it provided me to be able to demonstrate what I could do. And so I tell people that by giving someone the appropriate access, they can then achieve the level of success that they can achieve. But if we assume that an individual with a disability can't, if we close the doors to the things that they would be able to then do, if we don't build ramps into the buildings that they should be able to enter, we never get to see the full scope of what diversity is then improved by disability. We never get to see the ingenious things that people with disabilities will be able to come up with merely because we did not provide access. Now I tell people that, believe it or not, I've been a black man my entire life, but I've now only lived this world on both sides of the stethoscope as a physician and an individual with a disability for the past eight years. But it has been these past eight years that I truly felt more discriminated against than I ever had in my entire life as a black man. And this is not to say that I was not discriminated against as a black man, but it is to say that I felt that discrimination palpably more when people literally and figuratively kept me out of buildings and kept me away from the table because of a lack of accessibility. And so while this chair really did sort of open up my eyes and, and gave me opportunities, it was only within this past year that I recognized something that I now called sort of a tale from a reformed ableist. Because I started to also value my life based on my ability to then get back to what my previous life was back to a place where now I am upright and operating. And I felt as though that is what made me then have value again. And it was Judy Human, who if you don't know Judy Human, I encourage you to look her up after this. Judy Human was watching a little teaser for a film that's being made about me. And she said, you know, if, if I hadn't known you before I watched this, I don't think I would want to know you. She said, because this is a very macho film that you're showing me all huffing and puffing and lifting weights and, and walking. What message are you sending to those of us that don't walk? What message are you sending to people that either never regained the ability or never started with the ability to walk? If you are going to then claim that you're a disability advocate in some way, you need to be very careful about how the words you use have impact. And I recognize that as a physician, as an athlete, and as an able-minded individual, I thought that getting back to where I was before was that goal. Now, as someone who, who is very, very passionate about rehabilitation as well, I then have to then thread this line carefully when I tell people there should be nothing wrong with someone who wants to then be able to do a certain thing. But if we make people that do not have the ability to do that thing feel as though they are less than, merely because the communities that we are in do not provide them with the access to then show what they can do, we are perpetuating this belief that then being of able body and mind is better and then the alternative. And so I still use accommodations like my standing frame wheelchair, but I also make it very clear that an individual does not have to be upright, does not have to walk to be able to have access. And that is when it comes into engineering and STEM fields and what we can do to recognize that if we have other people with a variety of lived experience, we will end up coming up with products and procedures and things that are more accessible to the increasingly diverse world that we live in. Because you don't all have to be disabled Black immigrant Nigerian men to be able to know the importance of providing access for those communities. You're not always going to have the lived experience of someone else to be able to recognize the need. 
But if we are able to then acknowledge that the disability community has a lot that they can then provide and then give to the rest of the community, if we see that each and every one of us may enter this world of disability at some point, if we see how ubiquitous disability is, and it's the one group that any one of us could potentially enter at some point, we should not look at disability as something that is just about them. We shouldn't see access to be something that should only be for the 20% of people that we see as disabled. We should recognize that by providing access for the disability community, we are truly providing access for all communities. This pandemic has shown that it's the majority to which we lean. We create access and policies and procedures for the majority, and then we handle the one-offs afterwards. We handle the, the extra people that were not included in the initial programming to then see how it can then attend to them. But if we lead with our most vulnerable populations, making sure that our vaccine and testing sites were accessible for individuals of all disabilities, we will see that everyone will then have that access. So I didn't mention how after my injury, I <clears throat> was introduced to adaptive sports in the Rehab Institute of Chicago. And then I went back and I got a master's degree from Notre Dame in engineering, science and technology entrepreneurship. And I was talking to Dr. Boxing before this and was sort of aging myself by saying, I remember working on SolidWorks to do my CAD drawings for the, for the technologies that I was trying to put together at that time. And I do not claim to be a true, true engineer like many of you, but I did have an opportunity to then get this engineering entrepreneurship master's degree that allowed me to look at the world through a different lens. Instead of seeing just problems, it allowed me to think in a way that we were creating solutions. And so this, this opportunity for me to be seated and standing and reeling right next to a bunch of other individuals working on problems, but then having a different perspective from my own lived experience. <clears throat> Being able to then talk about what it would mean for an individual with a disability like mine to then be able to access this facility or be able to have access to this building changed the way that people were thinking about the work that we were doing recognizing that there were plenty of people that had not been included previously. And this is just once again, an N of one. I am not the first or the best or the only, but I am someone just like the rest of you that has a lived experience that then can contribute to any community that I join. But what I then began to realize soon after this injury was that there are so many individuals with disabilities that are not given the same access. I was blessed with resources. I had a job already that had good disability insurance coverage. I had a family that could provide access for me. And so my life did not get as derailed as it could have. And I recognized that I was just blessed and lucky to have those resources. And I had people that did what I call assumed competence. Rather than looking at me and thinking that I couldn't, they allowed me to work together with them to determine what I needed to show that I could. And that is what we can do with disability in a way that even if you don't understand it, even if you're not exactly sure why this individual needs this as an accommodation, it's not truly your responsibility to understand the why. And then as I talk to sort of my University of Michigan colleagues here, I've been very, very fortunate to work with a lot of individuals in the College of Engineering in terms of providing accommodations for our students. And I think that people are very well intentioned when trying to provide accommodations but I do think that we still need uh, to improve at times the stigma that exists where people view accommodations as an extra help. They view it as a, as a road that is going to be easier for that person to travel. And because of the desire to then maintain academic integrity and the academic rigor of our programming, we say, aren't we just setting these students up for failure if we then give them this accommodation and make this easier for them? The real world isn't easy like this. And so don't you think we should then let them know those harsh realities now before then setting them up for failure later? Now, I tell people that the world and the real world that we talk of is this institution as well. And if we can't demonstrate to our students and faculty and staff that we understand the diversity of the human experience, and the fact that disability is not something that should be stigmatized or, or you know, dehumanized, that disability is something that is just like anything else that makes us different from someone else, but it should not be the reason that we don't get access. If we recognize that by providing the reasonable and appropriate accommodations, we are going to then unlock the potential that individuals have to then change the world. That at the University of Michigan, as the leaders and the best, we should be the ones that understand this. And I tell people that physical accessibility is still something that we're very behind in. 
but it's still something that I think people have started to now understand. You know, I give analogies and stories all the time, and I tell people that I can, I can walk a bit, so I use crutches or a walker to walk, but it doesn't mean that because I can do something that I'm given the direct access. So the story I tell about is trying to get into a building, and if there's no ramp or elevator to get into that building, I may still be able to pull myself up the stairs. And if it's a day like this in Michigan, you know, 20 degrees, it's been snowing and wet and slushy, I may get into that building, pulling my wheelchair up each step as I crawl along the stairs to get inside. And you'll find me in the building. So at the end of the day, you can say, well, he was successful. So why do we need to provide a ramp to get into this building? Or why do we need to provide anything else in this building when he was able to get in? Now that physical accessibility question is one that I use because though I had to then crawl up the stairs, get wet and dirty and muddy and tired to get in, that was not access. So just because someone has been able to achieve without accommodations doesn't mean that they didn't need accommodations in the first place. So I use that to talk about the non-apparent or invisible disabilities. Some of the simple accommodations that people think about are extended time on an exam, and some people think, well, no, this, if the person can't do it in this amount of time, I don't know why we are making this test easier for them. And for a lot of our bright students here, unfortunately, the number of times I've read letters that have said, oh, you are too smart to be disabled. You're too smart to have a learning disability. Don't put that label on yourself. Look at, you did well, you got a B, a B plus, you got an A minus, you did well on these courses. Why are you trying to get this extra help for this disability? but you don't know how many figurative steps that this person had to climb up, how many wheelchairs they had to drag into the building just to get there. And so we need not be so afraid of individuals taking advantage of accommodations because the number of people that need that ramp to get into the building, the number of individuals that will have an undue burden to them being able to get access, and the number of individuals that will just not be able to get up the stairs at all and won't come in, we are missing out on an entire population of individuals. And so if we recognize that we just need to destigmatize the way we view disability and recognize that every single one of us needs some accommodation at some point, simple things like me wearing these glasses right now. I wear glasses and I'm nearsighted. I wouldn't be able to see very far without them, but people don't tend to see that as an unfair accommodation. But people then ask questions about why Dr. O is allowed to wear glasses and I can't. But when it comes to accommodations, people think that we are being unfair to those who don't need accommodations by providing them for those who do. Merely because we don't all understand what that disability related barrier might be for that student with a disability, we strive to then demonstrate that they can do just fine if they just work a little harder. I'm sure that this is something that they'll be able to get. Now we have a very good system of how we then make sure that we are identifying the disability related barriers, working with the clinicians and physicians that then are taking care of our students with disabilities to then be justified in our provision of accommodations. Because I do know that that is the concern that many faculty and staff have, is that if we cannot confirm that someone has a disability, how do we ever know that we are actually fairly providing accommodations and not being unfair to those who don't get accommodations because they don't need them. Now I'll say that we are blessed with a wonderful system here at Michigan with a team of individuals that, that do that work. And I encourage anyone to then talk with us if there are concerns about how that is being done. But as an instructor, I want to encourage people to then just know that their role is to work together with us and the student to make sure that we're providing that access. Because before I knew that standing frame wheelchairs existed, most people would not have been able to think about how we could then get certain things done. And that's the beautiful thing about engineering when you think of it. Because in engineering, we are literally creating pathways that may not have existed before. And so we should be able to be creative and innovative in the ways that we then do this work and should be creative and innovative in the way that we provide access to those who want to do it as well. And so to then start to wrap up here so we can have conversations, I told people about you know, my, my athletic background. And one of the things that we're trying to do here at Michigan, this is just one part of our program, but we're trying to provide equitable opportunities for individuals in sport as well. Now I use this because at our institution, Michigan is an amazing academic and athletic institution. Yet when it comes to disability, we did not have any access for students with disabilities in sport. And so I was introduced to adaptive sport during my rehab process. 
And I failed to recognize that throughout my life to that point, I had never seen adaptive sports, had never heard of adaptive sports, didn't even know what they were. Adaptive sports are sports the way that they're sort of historically described, sports for individuals with physical disabilities. Now, the way that I have tried to then conceptualize and promote adaptive sport is that these are sports that are not for people with disabilities. They're sports that allow people with disabilities to participate with their peers. And so this that I'm showing you here, there are a series of four images. All of these images are demonstrating and displaying the amazingly beautiful building that Alabama has. Yes, Alabama, for their adapted athletes. There's a locker room that you can see on the top right. There's their basketball locker room. The floors in that room are angled where the lockers are so the chairs don't roll back out. You've then got their basketball gymnasium on the left. You've got their strength and conditioning weight room on the bottom. You've got the foyer to one of their main buildings on the bottom right. And that middle building is that entire building itself. Now I show this actually not to show what I think that we need to emulate. Because while I'm very close with Alabama folks and we're colleagues, they know that I say this when I give presentations, I see this a bit as separate but equal. Because we moved the disabled athletes to a separate building to then have their access rather than utilizing the access that already existed. And so our goal here at Michigan is not to then create a separate but equal entity. It's to make sure that all of our students are formally integrated into the systems and structures and buildings that we already have. We're trying to reconceptualize what these equitable opportunities are and specifically related to sport and fitness, as we said, that's making sure that at every level, an individual with a disability will have access to be able to participate in the way they do. I give this because oftentimes people come and give a presentation and they don't give you any tangible action items for how you can then do something better. And this is just one example, once again, because I tell people I did not know anything about adaptive sports before I had my injury. But then recognizing that as a varsity All-American athlete myself, I knew what access I had been given. And it was devastating to then hear that plenty of students, student athletes were not getting that same access solely on the basis of disability. So similarly, if you think about your classrooms and you think about a student who may have not known throughout their entire high school career that they could receive accommodations for a disability that they had not wanted to disclose. And people don't disclose disability because of the stigma that exists around it. And people feel as though they will be seen as dumb, less than stupid, unable to perform, just looking for extra help. And that's not what accommodation should be. It's not what disability is. And we need to recognize that every single one of us has the opportunity to demonstrate what we can do if given those equitable opportunities. And so here I will end when we go to answer our questions. This is last year. We, we formed our adaptive sports and fitness program in about 2019 or so. And last year was our first year of competition. And our team ended up taking second place at the wheelchair tennis national championships, of course, second to Alabama. So we're working on that. But we have opportunities to provide equitable access in various ways. So in this image, this just gives the description of what we do in the adaptive sports and fitness program. We've got our adaptive sports student interest group. We've got the adaptive sport and inclusive recreation initiative, which is that right now every single sixth grade class in Ann Arbor Public Schools. So if any of you have any sixth graders in AAPS, they will start coming home and telling you about the ACERI program, where the PE programs in the public schools will all be learning about adaptive sports. Now, I don't mean just the adapted PE class, but every single sixth grader in Ann Arbor Public Schools will learn seated volleyball, wheelchair basketball, wheelchair tennis, adaptive fitness, goalball. They're going to learn sports and play sports with their disabled and non-disabled peers so that everyone recognizes that adaptive sports are just sports that allow everyone to participate. Just like you put on hockey skates to go play hockey, you put on a wheelchair sport chair to play a sport that takes a wheelchair. It is not someone that has to sit in that wheelchair to play it. If someone might not use a chair in their day-to-day -day life, you might not even have a disability at all, but it's another sport that we play. And that's going to, in the sixth grade's mind, destigmatize that chair and take away this sort of medical model of disability that sees disability as illness and pathology that needs to be fixed. But to recognize that it is just something that is once again, the fabric of diversity that we all are. And when people talk about needing help, that, that needing help is not something that's special to the disability community. Every single one of us needs help for something. And this is something that we can provide. 
We then also have our adaptive fitness component. We partnered with the Ann Arbor Center for Independent Living and renovated the gymnasium they had there to make it accessible for individuals with disabilities. And lastly, it's not on here now, but we have another grant that's called Prescription to Play, where we're going to be working with the health systems across the community to then make sure that at any stage that you enter the system, whether it's outpatient therapy or the ER or your orthopedic surgeon's office, that adaptive sports is, is something that people talk about. Because every single one of our individuals that comes through the health system could benefit from access to physical fitness. And then underneath, we've got our competitive sports, wheelchair tennis, ambulatory track and field, para equestrian, and wheelchair basketball. And so once again, as I said, this is just an example outside of the classroom example that people have started to understand in terms of providing accommodations of what is it that we can do to then disabuse disability, to no longer make people feel that disability means inability, to recognize that providing accommodations is not giving someone an extra help or a leg up or an advantage, but it's merely trying to fill that hole that we saw in that last slide of the individual in the box sized hole. It's merely trying to take the wood and build a ramp instead of building a box. It's merely trying to make sure that everybody has the access that they deserve to be able to demonstrate what success that they can achieve. So with that, I will have Dr. Potsy come back up and we'll start taking some of your questions. Thank you for those of you that put some in the chat. I, I touched on a bit of them, but I know we've got some, some questions that were sent in ahead of time and some questions that came in during. So Dr. Potsy, back to you. Thank you, Dr. O, for that wonderful presentation. Very important topics, and we're really grateful to you for taking time to speak with us today. Uh, I would like to invite our audience members to ask questions in the Q&A. We do have a few minutes for questions. Uh, let's begin with one question that came in earlier. Uh, someone is asking about what is the best way to make sure we're accommodating someone's disability? Simple question, but I'm sure um, you'll be able to uh, give us some ideas here. Certainly. So thank you for that first question. And to repeat, they said, what is the best way to make sure that we are accommodating someone's disability? Now, I that question gets asked often, and I hope not to to come across as patronizing with my answer. But I, I usually say, how do you ever know how you can then help someone? Because a lot of times what we do is in the disability world is that we make an assumption as to what that person needs. And then we tell them that this is what they're going to get. So the easiest answer is you ask them. If an individual has then identified or disclosed to you that they have a disability, you include them in the conversation about what they may need I tell a quick story about this where I was giving a grand rounds back in my orthopedic surgery residency and one of my faculty members was there and he, he actually raised his hand to tell a story. He said that his son at that time was in kindergarten or first grade and his homework said color the circle blue. But his son was colorblind. And so he said, I just used to rack my brain. I did not know how he was getting this homework done. So one day I asked him, I said, Johnny, your homework says color the circle blue, but you're colorblind. How, how are you getting your homework done? Now, I've never done this before, but I'm going to pause and see if anyone, if you've heard this talk before, heard me, don't answer. But how do you think he got his homework done? Does anybody want to put an answer in the chat? How do you think that this kindergartner who was, boom, thank you very much. The son looked at his dad and said, dad, I never use crayons that aren't labeled. I use that just because at times we think that it's difficult to provide accommodations. We may not be able to then know what that accommodation may be to support someone, but if we include that person, the answer may be much simpler than we think. And so while not everything is as simple as a label on a crayon, there are very simple accommodations that we may not even think of at first, but that if we include that individual, guess what? Especially if we're speaking about college students, many of them have figured out how to then get through. And they may already have an understanding of what accommodation they may need, but also they may not. And so when you talk to someone about what barriers they're experiencing, that's when I talk about in the engineering world specifically, we are the ones that come up with these things that are, are achieving things that have never been done before. And so I think we can use that same mental energy to figure out a way to provide access for someone who wants to then be an engineer, who wants to then get an education here at Michigan. We can figure out how to then make sure that they're getting equitable access without compromising the academic rigor of the course of study. Because I know that is usually the primary concern that people have and there's absolutely a way we can do so. So 
involve the person, ask the person. Perfect. That's very helpful. Thank you. Another question that came in has to do with recruiting students with disabilities to work on research projects without making them feel like we only are interested in working with them because they have a disability. Do you have thoughts on that? Absolutely. So there's, first of all, you know, the, the same thing that I just mentioned, I think is a good piggyback on this question because there's, there's the phrase that is not just in the disability community, but often people say nothing about us without us, which is essentially saying that you should not be making decisions about some person's body and what they're gonna do without including them. But then there's also the concern about the minority tax, where is that why are we going to take these minoritized populations and make them responsible for coming up with all the solutions and making them feel like guinea pigs, just that they're being you know, looked at in a test tube to then study them, right? So I think that it is a difficult balance to then have, but I think that when done in a way that is respectful, and when you recognize that, no, we are not just having you here as our token disabled person to then study you, but in fact, we just want you to be an actual legitimate partner in this process because we recognize that you have something to add as opposed to we want to study you to learn how to then fix the world for you. We recognize that you have some perspective here that we don't have, and therefore we would like to involve you in this process. Many people have probably heard about participatory action research. Participatory action research is really just research that includes the stakeholders in the community of which you help to serve. And so it's not dropping into you know, some underserved community and thinking that you are the savior that has all the answers and then popping out and then thinking that you solved their problems for them. It's including individuals in the process. And when the communities know that that is the mechanism and that's the sentiment behind what you're doing, then they'll be able to build trust and have an understanding of that that's what's happening in the future. But too often, I think that it is truly a transactional relationship where we think we're coming in to identify their problems and fix them for them without truly including them or us. I say them because it's not just disability, right? But any, any population that you are hoping to, to study in some way, you ask yourself, are you studying them to then fix a problem that they've identified? Or are you studying them to fix a problem that you thought you saw that you are trying to fix for them without them being part of it? Absolutely. Thank you so much. That's very helpful um angle to look at this so very helpful um yeah so there are many questions that are coming in so thank you all for putting the questions uh in the chat and the q a uh one question that came in let's see here going back to the initial images that you shared about equality versus equity what do you say to someone with a zero sum game myth that there are only so many boxes to help hold people up? So the, the, the zero sum game myth, and this is where I'm, people that know me know I'm very real. And so I tell people that if you want to know an institution's priorities, you look at their budget. Because the reality is that while it might not be a zero sum game, it is something that there are limited resources to be able to then provide the things that we need. And so if an institution is actually committed to making sure that things are accessible, that has to be listed somewhere high on their priority. But unfortunately people say, oh, we have all of these other things we need to do and so we haven't got to accessibility yet. If people recognized that accessibility is not just for the disability community, if they start to recognize that statement that everyone can use the ramp without everyone, without everyone can use the ramp, but not everyone can use the stairs, they'll see that while we think we're accommodating a small population of people, the individual pushing a stroller can use that ramp. The person delivering the UPS package can use that ramp. And so when we're making a community culture and climate that is accessible, not only will that be something that benefits more than just the disability community that you think you're serving, but it will also demonstrate to that community that you see them, that you value them, that you respect them. Because unfortunately, when physical access, once again, is not even accomplished, it gives away the fact that we do not value disabled body minds in the same way. And so when it comes down to the dollars and cents at the end of the day, people will see that by putting accessibility in place, at the beginning, you may say it costs more money for the ramp wood than it does for the box wood, but the ROI that you get for giving more people access to that building to be able to then come up with solutions 
you're going to then include more people and more people will benefit than who you thought you were serving to begin with. And so that's a, a mindset shift that we have to get to because people look at the priorities they have and they do not put accessibility as number one or two or three, but they fail to recognize that when you do all of these things, accessibility is gonna come up in some way and you're going to be criticized more after the fact for not providing accessibility at the beginning. And it's also much harder to go in and to then add accessibility after the fact than had you been proactive in making sure that it was done so beforehand. Absolutely, absolutely. That makes sense. So you spoke quite a bit about students, and of course, we're extremely interested in increasing diversity of our students. And diversity, as you very nicely showed, includes ability and disability. Um, do you have thoughts about staff and faculty disability equity at University of Michigan and Michigan Medicine? I certainly do. So as, as a faculty and staff member myself, my own sort of need for accessibility has come up since I've been here. And I actually just had a call earlier today with Christina Klein. So it used to be called, you know, Office for Institutional Equity. Now it's ECRT, Equity, Civil Rights, and Title IX Office. And so Christina Klein is the ADA coordinator, and she has a deputy ADA coordinator, Megan Marshall, now as well. So as it pertains to faculty and staff accommodations, I, I personally right, will say that that is the office that you work with directly, but we all are, are partners in this work. So there are plenty of people all across campus that are trying to then make the institution, you know, the institution that we know it can be, but just very directly so pe people know the resource that exists. That's Christina Klein and Megan Marshall as the ADA coordinators. And it is something that I, I do think that we have more of a, an appetite for providing accommodations for our students right now. And we are working to catch up on the accommodations for faculty and staff. And one thing I, I say very directly to people is when a student sees a faculty or staff member that is struggling to get accommodations themselves, why would that student then want to then remain here as a postdoc or as a faculty member? Because it's, it's demonstrating to them that at this stage in your career as a student, we may see you as in need of accommodations and provide them. But if we don't see you as that same person worthy of accommodations when you are a faculty or staff member, what does that say about the culture and climate of our institution? And so I want to be clear in that I know that there are many, many people that are working on doing this at the institution. And we've got the support from institutional leadership to make sure that we're providing those accommodations. But just like I acknowledge my own sort of uh, able, able bodied mindset, my own, you know, being complicit and perpetuating ableism, I know that it's not pointing fingers to say that people are at fault for not doing it. One of the phrases that I use is that the past may not be your fault, but the future will be. And so what are we going to do when we now recognize the inaccessibility of our world to make sure that someone's tomorrow is better than their yesterday? And so that's the hope is that tomorrow will be much better for students, faculty, and staff because we still have a significant way to go even though we're 30 plus years after the Americans with Disabilities Act, that is still the floor and we certainly haven't even reached the floor in certain spaces in our institution for faculty and staff accessibility and accommodations. But Christina Klein and Megan Marshall and the entire office are working on that. And I know the institution sees it as a priority, but we've got some way to go and we're headed in that right direction. Great, thank you. That is very helpful. And uh, Michelle has put in the chat uh, those resources. Let's see here, we have another question. Um, how do you personally deal with ableist comments made by your peers or ableist ideas rooted in the field of work or in your field of work? Sorry, could you repeat? I was reading a question that came in. Yeah. Right? How do you personally deal with ableist comments that might be made by your peers? Oh, so that's, it, it depends. Uh, it depends on how I feel that day depends on what side of the bed I woke up on, but I, I try to show grace. And, and, I, and this is something that not everyone likes because at times showing grace looks as if you're giving a pass, right? Because there are some people that do know better and will do so, but then there are some people that really just don't know better yet. And when I'm not sure how to differentiate them, 
I think that it's always in my best interest. If I'm talking about peers and colleagues that I work with, and this is, this is me giving straight answers, it's better to then, you get further with, with honey than you do with vinegar or whatever the saying is, is that I don't try, I don't want to push people away who may not recognize how their ableism is showing, right? And so I, I might subtly introduce them to the concepts that they may not have heard of before. I will try to then use sort of a lighthearted conversation to then demonstrate to them how what they said could be very triggering or damaging to someone, right? But I do, I, I do make it clear to people also that I'm, I'm not, while I might be nice and, and welcoming, I'm also not a pushover. And so there are also times I'm very direct about the, the harms that people are doing, because if, if we fail to see what resources are there, if we fail to acknowledge things that other people have demonstrated, at a certain point, that is, that is ignorance on our part, because there's plenty of information out there. And to talk about our institution specifically, the Student Idea Board was put together by the Provost's Office in 2019, and many, many people of this institution, including the College of Engineering, were involved in this work. And there have already been identified things that we can improve upon in our institution around accessibility and inclusion. And so I think that there are not much longer that many people can then claim that they are unaware of the inaccessibility of our spaces here. And so the way I deal with it is I try to educate, I try to show grace, but I also try to then hold people accountable to say, to go back to my phrase, the past may not be your fault, but the future will be. And so therefore, now that you've been told that this is an ableist mindset, now that you've been introduced to the inaccessibility of this space, what can we do to then make it better? So it's just like racist comments, sexist comments, you know, xenophobic comments, is that it's harmful. And it, it's sometimes it's easy to then snap back at someone. But unfortunately, I don't, I have not seen that in my experience being the way to then make change. But I do not criticize people who then use a little bit more vinegar than they use honey, because I think that it's necessary for people to advocate in the way that they feel best and feel comfortable. And I think all forms of advocacy are necessary. It's just not that one, one individual may not then embody all of those different efforts. Absolutely. I think that education is key. And here at Michigan Engineering, we have a, a new initiative which centers DEI education for everyone at the college, including bystander intervention training. So hopefully we can equip people to be able to intervene when they see harm in all these cases. Yeah. Well, I'd like to thank you so much for joining us today again. It's been really wonderful talking to you. We learned uh, a lot and I hope that we can have you again if you wish to come and, and talk to us again in the future. And with that, I'd like to uh, close this DI lecture. Our next DI lecture will be on February 24th at 12 p.m. with Dr. Paulette Vincent Roos. And you can find the registration link for our next lecture in the chat. We will also follow up with an email uh, to this event. She will be sharing her research on equity-centered approaches to researching injustices in STEM education. And we really hope to, to see you there. Thanks again, uh, Dr. O, and thank you all for coming today. Have a great week.